Hello and welcome to episode 141 of the Board Game Barrage podcast. One for one and three for all. As they say. Yeah, as they say. That was the Three Musketeers thing, right? Uh huh. So they said. A three four for all? Yeah. The hell does that mean? Four of us, the four tanks. There are three people, Mark. Yeah, but there are four tanks. Or are you forgetting a certain blue tank? Are you forgetting our patrons? You f- <laughs> Uh, I am the green tank, and with me as always are two of the four for all tanks, Kellen the red tank, hello, and Neilan the orange tank, hello. Today we are talking about expectations, what we expect when it comes to when we hear a game is being published by a certain company or made by a designer, or when we see that price tag, hundred dollar game. What do you expect when you see that? $10 game on the other side. What do you expect when you see that? So we're going to be talking about what expectations we have when we see various variables. One could say great expectations. What to expect 13. when you're expecting. A novel by Charles Dickens. <laughs> Who's your novel by, Neilan? I'm just attributing to moms everywhere. There you go. Do you know what great expectations is, Neilan? I, I am aware of the Charles Dickens novel. Are you? I Who's am. the protagonist? Uh, you know what? I actually don't know that. I've not read it. His name's Pip. Neilan, I'm so his sorry. name is Pip. That's a good name. Before we talk about expectations, let's talk about known quantities, those being the games that we've actually played. Kellen's going to start us off by talking about Shobu. I'm going to follow up with my play of Pan Am, and Neilan will round us out with a game that is wrapping up its Kickstarter, Planet Unknown. Kellen, tell us about Shobu. Well, I think that that segment where we tell all the games, you know, that we are covering yeah. is really revealing who's the best hype man. Um, that was smooth. Of which you are the worst. Are you kidding me? I that mean, was there was so there was no drama. Smooth. Where I, I silky smooth. I was like, I said, Kellen's going to start us off. Like I'm a boring cup next, of tea. And then Neilan rounding us out. I used all the, the right language. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me let me get us there. Shobu is a game from Smirk and Dagger, and it is a two-player abstract game. So it's a little bit of a mismatch with the publisher, Smirk and Dagger being known for making sort of more social deductions, stab your friends in the back game. Shobu is a abstract strategy game that looks like, sort of like mini Go, except there are four boards happening at the same time. So you have two boards on your side of a literal rope that they give you, and then two boards on the other side of the rope. It's a four by four grid. So there are four of them, four black rocks on one side, four white rocks on the other. So the main conceit of this game is essentially each turn you take a passive move and an active move. And your passive move can't push your opponent's pieces. So you move up to two spaces in any direction. And then on the other color board, you are allowed to make an active move and you must move a piece in that same direction, in that same amount, but you can push your opponent's pieces with that active move. And the only goal of the game is to remove all four pieces of your opponent's color from any of the four boards. So that's almost all of the rules. It is very simple, very straightforward, uh, very visually striking. You've got wood boards, you've got a rope in the middle, and it looks like they went to like a gas station with all those uh, colored rocks in it. (laughs) <laughs> and then like picked out the black ones and the white ones because there is no size that was too weird for them to include in Shobu. This is a game I've played now four or five times, uh, multiple times with Christina, multiple times with my brother, and enjoyed it a lot. I think that the fun part for me is that moment of, oh, I actually don't care. Even if I get down to one piece on this board, that's fine, provided I can screw up Mark enough on the other board. And so there's this back and forth where you're almost like putting people into check on every board. You know, it's like, okay, I can't figure that out there, but I'm only one move away. So now I'm going to pivot to this board. And as you lose pieces, you actually lose the ability to control other boards because you have control over two boards on your side of the rope and those affect the opposites, which one of those boards is on your side and one of those boards is on their side. So you actually have to look at a picture of this, I think, to even understand what I'm saying, because I'm saying it very clearly, obviously. But uh, <laughs> but like you have more control over your side of the board, so you can make a passive and an active move on your side, 
as long as you make the passive on one board and then the active on the other. So you have less control of what goes on on the other side of the rope. And that is a good thing to think about because that is literally the only use for the rope that they have included in this game, (laughs) which is to think beyond the rope, son, you have less control. The passive and active move system is fine. I like this game and I would be excited to share it with both of you and play it once. I think the real fun, the real pleasure here is the fact that each board is slowly spiraling out of control and you like win on one and are losing on another, but all that you care about is getting one to to win. I think that's a fun conceit. I think Shobu is great. I think people who like abstract strategy are going to love it. And and they have. Reception has been very, very positive uh, to Shobu. I'm not unconvinced that there's a first player advantage, but maybe I just need to get good. What do you guys want to know about Shobu? First of all, how long does a game last? We're talking about like 15 minutes or so? Yeah, and I think, too, that like chess... There probably is a moment where once you're good at it, you know that you've lost already. Sure. And instead of dragging out the inevitable, you know, 10 minutes of tit for tat, you kind of just end it. How does this stack up with other two-player abstracts like Onitama and the Duke and stuff like that for you? Yeah, I, I like Onitama a lot. I haven't played the Duke. I don't really like two-player abstract games. Yeah. So I do think there's a limited shelf life for this game, even though it's beautiful and I really like it. I kind of had hoped that it would be like a mini Go replacement, you know, that I could leave out and always play. And I don't think it has that timeless property for me. You know, I still have plans of getting a custom-made chess set, okay? One of the pieces is pink. Let me guess. One of them is light blue. No, not Pokemon. (laughs) (laughs) In this one, like imagine the shiniest paint and then it's even shinier. Like it's dripping off of it, you know? And one of those is light pink and one of those is light blue. Wow. What do they look like though? Oh, classic. Staunton, what are you talking about? Come on, man. Is Staunton a classic chess Actually, I really wish that I was sure of how to pronounce Staunton (laughs) or Staunton. Is that the classic? Yeah, that is the classic chess. I would never have a chess set that was not just the Staunton pieces. I had a friend who was quite good, had a a very good ELO in chess, and we used to play every night over mint tea. Peppermint, actually. (laughs) And I didn't beat him till like the second to last day of my six-month stay with him, and the Padawan became the master. (laughs) I like chess, actually. Surprise, surprise. Queen's Gambit, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) I've not played chess since high school, but I did like it. I love watching chess. I love watching high-level chess. Whenever the world championships are on, I'm always into it. Yeah, so I think Shobu is good. I think yeah. you'd both like it. I'd be happy to to pass it off to either of you, and I think you'd get a kick out of it. I don't know the staying power, yeah. but what modern game has staying power? It may not be a classic, but it certainly does have a classic look. I, I like the like the random stones being the playing pieces. It just gives it some sort of like timeless, let's just mark out the board in the sand sort of thing right. and, and play with, with stones. I also think that like when you're talking about the concept of having a set that you'd want to keep out all the time, like Shobu sure. is one of those games, right? Like It almost feels like you could just have a table with it laid out permanently and it would be... Right. Very aesthetically pleasing. And that is Shobu by Smirk and Dagger Games. I played Pan Am. This is a new game from the folks at uh, Prospero Hall. They have Villainous and Horrified and Jaws and Funkoverse and Wonder Woman and Top Gun and Back to the Future and a bunch of IP-based games that actually turn out to be pretty darn good and also mass-marketed. These are games that are almost all uh, available at uh, big box stores. Uh, And you know the big box store that I'm going to recommend is going to be Target for all your Prospero Hall game needs. So yeah, these are all mass marketed games that are meant to be sort of easy for families to pick up and play. I would classify Pan Am as maybe a step past that. It sort of felt in terms of complexity for me the same way I felt about Wonder Woman, which is uh, again a Prospero Hall game that felt to me a little more complex than like a game that you would feel super comfortable with newcomers to the hobby, but certainly a game that you could teach them. In Pan Am, What you're trying to do is you are running a a small airline and you're trying to be the most successful at basically being gobbled up by Pan Am Airlines, which is taking over the board as the game progresses. Most successful at getting bought by another company? Yeah. You might say you want to get got in this game. Oh. See? A little reversal. 
Could be. <laughs> <laughs> and so the way this works is that at the end of the game, whoever has the most Pan Am stock, doesn't matter how successful you've been, how much money you've, you've accrued, whoever has the most Pan Am stock at the end of the game wins. That is the win condition. So that might make you think that this is a stock market game. This is does make me think that. Not at all a stock market game. You idiot, Kellen. The stocks in this game are basically victory points. You're basically buying victory points throughout the game. So what sort of made me interested in this, aside from the fact that it's Prospero Hall, and I do really like the fact that they can take these interesting or beloved IPs. Not that Pan Am is super beloved, but uh, it's it's interesting to have a, a Pan Am-based game. And that they make solid games. I think all their games are pretty much undeniably, at the very least, solid. What also interested me was the fact that at least as far as I can tell, the like sort of board game intelligentsia have been sort of raving about Pan Am. I've heard a lot of really, really good things from reviewers about Pan Am. I, a lot of like this was the surprise of the last couple months for me or whatever, that kind of thing. So I was, uh, I was excited to play it. The way that Pan Am works is that at the beginning of every round, of which there are seven, an event card will flip out, which tells you an event that's going to affect everybody, as well as how the Pan Am stock price is going to fluctuate and how aggressively Pan Am is going to expand. Then you are placing your engineers, which are workers, on the board in one of uh, five spaces. You're either placing them to bid for airports, which give you the rights over landing in a city and also income. So you, if you win the airport bid, and the bidding is cyclity style, where there are numbers printed on the board, and if you want to outbid somebody, you can, but you have to select one of the higher numbers and then when you outbid somebody, their pawn goes back to them, and you're there until somebody outbids you. So it's like, if you're familiar with Cyclades bidding... You're saying it's an auction game. It is an auction game. At least in three of the five worker placement spots, it is an auction game. That's correct. We've never heard of Cyclades, though. That wasn't one of the 27 games we mentioned in our All About Auctions. I think Neilan had a rant on it that I cut out, but yeah, I think in the final cut. We'll have to go back and change that title. <laughs> almost All About Auctions? It's still all A's, almost all about auctions. Anyhow, so you can bid for airports, which give you presence in a city and also up your income. You can bid on these destination cards that come out, and each destination card is a city on the board. So if you win the auction for a destination card, you have landing rights for Manila or for Los Angeles or wherever city that you win. You also bid over planes to add to your fleet. So those are the three places where you bid. Your workers can also go in two other spots, which are the ability to place routes. So if you're first in line in the route location, you can build your route first. And then finally, the last spot is what's called a directive spot, where you get these cards when you place a, a worker there that allow you to bend the rules in subsequent rounds of the game and also give you priority placement in further worker placement spots. So you place airports, you gather these city cards, and you up your fleet. And what you're doing is once you start building routes, when you have workers on the route building space, you can build routes anywhere on the board, as long as the two cities are connected, you have presence in the two cities, and you have a plane that can make the flight. Presence in the two cities is based on like having either an airport or the city card. So you know, if I want to do a flight from Tokyo to Nome, I either can have an airport, say, on Tokyo and the Nome card or some combination. There's ways around it, but you have to have presence in the two cities. And depending on how long the flight is, you have to have a, a plane that can make it. So there are these small routes that you can have these little puddle jumper planes, but they don't really add much income. Or you can have these very, very long routes that make you a lot of income, but you need a big jet to fly it, but you get a lot of money. You claim these routes, you get income from these routes, and then after everybody's done that, Pan Am takes their turn. And the way uh, that works is you roll a die and starting from Miami, which I'm hoping is where Pan Am was founded or something, because then it doesn't make thematic sense otherwise. But starting with Miami, Pan Am will expand and they will expand based on like the number of dice rolls. So when they're being aggressive and expanding, you, the car tells you to roll the dice three times. And if they're being less aggressive, you'll roll the dice once. And so you roll the dice and it'll tell you which directions Pan Am expands. And if they expand into a, a route that you own, they take it over. They buy it out from you. And you lose the income because Pan Am has taken it over, but you get a big cash injection. So a lot of times you want Pan Am to buy you out because even though it lowers your income, you get a lot of money. And then you will use that money right after the Pan Am expands. You get the chance to buy Pan Am stock. The trade-off there is, do I want to buy stock now? Especially early in the game, it tends to be cheaper because the stock hasn't really risen. But I'm going to be less liquid for subsequent rounds. And that's how it goes. You do that over and over again seven times, and that's Pan Am. So... 
I think, and we're talking about expectations, and I think that's appropriate for me in, in my play of Pan Am because Prospero Hall has now sort of raised expectations in my mind to you know what their games can be. If I had played Pan Am without the Prospero Hall being involved or before I was acquainted with Prospero Hall and their quality, I would have like no expectations. As things are, I had high expectations. And I have to say that although I think this is a solid game and I had a good time, it was a game where, unlike most others, where I did not feel like I'd ever really want to play it again. Like, it felt like a game to me, like, this is great, and it has variability. Like, there's a lot of ways that the games will be different, but I just felt like after playing it, I didn't really have much interest in playing it again. Even though I, get, I think it's completely sound and solid, it just, for whatever reason, wasn't really too exciting for me and i wonder if that is maybe because it's meant to be introduced to people who aren't into games although again i'll say that it's, it does feel a little more complicated than like a game you would be completely comfortable introducing to non-gamers like a bob ross which is by prospero hall or horrified or something like that sounds fun to me stop being such a miss have a sham <laughs> is this what you can do you can have uh, great expectation references the entire episode i don't know i think it was again the expectation level from prospero hall and from all these great reviews like all these people are like singing its praises, and again, I think it's a fine game, but I, I didn't see anything especially sparkling about it. You know, I'd be happy to play with you guys, but I just did not feel any drive to play it again after packing it up. I'm actually genuinely bummed because I, I had not seen pictures of this before. But pulling this up, as we tend to do when other people are talking about games we've not played, I've been looking at this board and the art for the cards, and I think it looks stunning. It has a really cool, like, retro look to it. Like, yeah. The cards with, like, the art, you know. Yeah, the card art's good. Little plastic planes. This and it's weird solid. ass it's, projection of the world. It's, it's great. It's totally solid. I think maybe those, like, directive cards that I was talking about that allow you to bend the rules maybe would introduce a little bit of randomness and swigginess that people wouldn't be super happy about especially people who are like hardcore gamers might be a little turned off by that i thought it was okay but i just don't know i don't know i think expectations legitimately hurt this game for me Were too great yes <laughs> there was always dickinsonian levels of expectations to me for this game but uh anyway i'm not panning it but uh i'm not amming it am i oh uh, no, i don't know god i don't know i don't know i wanted to do something there uh but that is pan am by prospero hall Look for it at your local Target, but then probably get something else instead, like Horrified or something else. See that it's there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Acknowledge its existence, <laughs> and then perhaps move on. But it's good. It's fine. I mean, look it up. See if you like it. Neilan, let's get to Unknown Island. No, Planet yeah. Unknown. Un Unknown Planet Island. Uh, no, my game is called Planet Unknown. This is a recently finished Kickstarter that you are still able to late pledge on. And I had zero expectations for this because I kind of was just brought into the fold about this game very quickly, very recently by a friend of the site, one of our moderators and of our Discord, Woggers. He had been raving about this game that he'd learned the rules for that is a polyomino game. And those are all the words I need to hear in one sentence for me to be excited. Although, to be honest, then I immediately looked at the Kickstarter and I just had this immediate sense of what could a polyomino game do to distinguish itself so i went into a tabletop simulator game with him and a couple of other discorders and we sort of just played through a round of it all of us for the first time it is a pretty interesting take on a polyomino tile laying game because you have these five almost i want to say call them tech tracks only one of them is actually technically called the tech tracks but they're five different tracks that give you different abilities and depending on the polyomino you place each one is divided into two colors you move up of those two different tracks and they grant you different abilities depending on how high up they move along those tracks so visually imagine like this planet that's sort of a circular board and on every turn you have this lazy susan of polyomino tiles that's in the middle of the table you're going to orient it on your turn to whichever section whichever compartment you want facing you and draft a tile from that section and then the sections which are pointing towards the other players they just have to pick from that section so on your turn you have the most choice and they just have to sort of draft off of the choice you make so it's got a little bit of that roll and write feel to it and i think this is actually something that feels pretty preeminent in the feel of this game and that what's going to ultimately happen is because you're not able to make the most optimal choice every single turn 
you effectively build yourself into corners by the end of the game as you're trying to fill out your grid. What you're trying to do ultimately is create consecutive rows and columns because those will score points at the end of the game as well as advance up all of these four tracks that i've mentioned the kicker to all of this is all the powers that you're going to be gaining by moving up these tracks one of them is going to be just raw points another one of them is going to when you get to certain intervals give you access to cards that you're going to be able to draw from these smaller decks so the first person to get to that point will get first pick of say the tech one cards, the second person will get whatever's left over and so on. And those cards get better and better and better as you move through the tiered decks. One of the tracks is all about moving your little rovers around the map. So once you move up that track, you place a rover onto your board and you can start to move it a certain number of spaces in order to collect little things that are on your board at the start of the game, or that might come onto it during the game. One of the tracks is about acquiring little one-by-one tiles, which are always good for filling in the gaps. And then finally, there's a track that just is going to give you passive upgrades. One of the things that's going to separate this in subsequent plays is that every planet you play is different, is going to have different goals that you're working towards. And that's paired with a different tech board, which is going to give you different passive abilities as you move up that tech track. So there are two levels of asymmetry that sort of get paired to each other for every player, which is going to give you ultimately different goals, different benefits, and just fun, different competing objectives. You're also going to be competing with your neighbor on these goal cards. So everyone is going to have a goal between them onto their left and their right. And then if you're fighting for an objective with the person to your left and fighting for a different objective with the person to your right, all of this gets tallied up at the end of the game based on how high you're moved up the tracks, how many rows and columns you filled on your grid, and how many of the competing objectives you've managed to complete. It plays cleanly in about an hour. It's an extremely simple game, and it kind of looks really, really gorgeous. Like I was impressed for a game that I went in without any expectations for how how much I liked it. Kind of just sort of came out of nowhere for me, and I, I kind of really dug it. It takes a lot, I feel, to like separate yourself in this very overcrowded space of just tile laying games, especially polyomino tile laying games, and I feel like this one did gangbusters in that regard. I'm looking at the pictures of it now, and so when you're playing with different planets, all your opponents are playing with the same planet board, is that correct? No. So when we played on TTS, I believe that there was only one of these planets implemented, so everyone is just playing on the same basic board, but I believe in the actual game, everyone has a completely different planet. And to be clear, like, the asymmetry of the planets alone, separate from, like, the tech abilities, is also pretty wild, because there are certain objectives and different ways to score that is going to depend on the planet you're playing, so yeah, it's going to be pretty different between the players. And so this seems certainly more complicated than, you know, a lot of other tiling games. But you are saying that, first of all, that complexity isn't a hurdle so much. It's easy to sort of understand. It's not really, really all that complex. No, not really at all. Because I, I think that you're, all you sort of have to really explain to people is the way that the five different tracks work, which right. isn't that much to them, to be perfectly honest. And then just a couple of the different scoring objectives. And right. that's kind of it, really. It feels like a similar complexity to the Uve like polyomino games maybe like a sure. slight notch above those but certainly not that much more i i'd be interested in seeing the tts mod or in real life because when i saw the cover art i did not have great expectations yeah the cover art is uh yes i will definitely say that like their title art i guess is yeah yeah not super great but i i think the components uh, and even just the way that they look inside of tts are I would say quite well done. They're clean and readable, which is the main thing you want. You know, they've got a sort of like a cartoonish flair to them, but in a way that doesn't detract from their readability, which is the main thing you'd want. You want to sort of be able to clearly see what each polyomino is giving you when you draft it. But yeah, I like the aesthetics. It's clean. It's got some nice variance in the art between the planets and the corporations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at the real life components. I don't know if this is a prototype or what, but they seem to be just fine and and totally readable and not a, a negative at all from what I'm seeing here. One of the things I feel like that's always like a little bit frustrating about this sort of Kickstarter thing is like they have this big selling point of oh my god, it's got this lazy Susan thing and, and you know that's like a game trays component right which you know that's whatever take it or leave it like I think the thing that's always going to be frustrating about this sort of project is it is inevitably going to have kickstarter bloat it's inevitably going to be selling for slightly more maybe than a similar product would be at retail but i came away impressed by it enough to be very intrigued when it does eventually arrive and you should still be able to late pledge it at the time of release 
cool. Yeah, it looks it looks interesting. I, I definitely want to give it a spin. Will Callan like this game? Potentially. Actually, one thing I sort of actually forgot to mention that you just reminded me by asking that question, Kellen, is it's got a little bit of the Ganchon's Clever sort of like, if I go up this track, it's going to allow me to go mm. up this other track as well. And you sort of, if you optimally time it, you're sort of bouncing up multiple tracks all at once. It's got the slightest hint of that to it, which I know you like that. So, <laughs> If that became my joke to just ask that question, then I wouldn't even have to listen at all while either of you were talking. I mean, and you already do so little listening, so that'd be even perfect. That'd be a cherry on top. I'd go from a little to none is what That's you're right. saying. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's rude. All right. So before we get into expectations great and otherwise, I just want to put a shout out that we are officially going back to Apecorn math trades. So we ran our first three math trades using the Apecorn system, and they were big hits. And in fact, they were such big hits that the admins over at Apecorn are going to be implementing what's called a perpetual trade for Board Game Barrage listeners and other folks. So this will be a trade that is going to be basically running every month. So we'll have like a monthly trade and we'll see how that goes for a couple months. But uh, that's what we're, we're setting up there. So if you're interested in joining the Board Game Barrage math trade, you can go to boardgamebarrage.com slash trade and join on in. As with all our other trades, these are meant to be very beginner friendly. So we try to make sure that nobody makes any big mistakes. And if you do accidentally make a big mistake, we'll try our best to catch it. And so, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, we generally have a couple hundred games traded every time we've done it. And I think generally it's been a lot of fun. We have people clamoring for us to start the next trade the minute one is completed. So uh, join the fun at boardgamebarrage.com slash trade. I am ready to never use O-W-L-W-G-L-G-G again. (laughs) I'm with you. I have converted to Apecorn. On to expectations. What are some things that lead to mismatched expectations for you all? You're thinking one thing's going to happen, and then you find out that the game isn't quite what you expected or is better than you expected. What are your just general thoughts on misfounded expectations? I think one of the ones that's been the biggest for me over the years has been perceived weight. And I feel like this still sometimes gets in my way a little bit. Like, I feel like it's the reason, quite simply, that I haven't played like 18xx games is this idea that they're too heavy or more heavy than I want them to be. I think the way that this has borne out for me in the past was something like Terra Mystica, which is a game I put off playing for a long time, despite, especially at the time I was looking into this, you know, five, six, seven years ago, quite high on the BGG listings. But I always had this idea that it was so heavy. And I mean, this is even despite liking other heavy games, like through the ages is something I came to early, but I still just had this idea that I would, I wouldn't want to learn something like Terra Mystica until I had the rule book in front of me. And I read through the thing. I was like, you know, this is heavy in the scale of board games, but it's not that bad. Like, I feel like once you've heard the rules and you have the board in front of you, it's never as bad as you anticipate it's going to be. I think one of the other games that this especially bore out for me was in Brass Birmingham. Brass is, you know, it is still one of the heavier games, I know. But again, I just had this idea in my head that it was insurmountable. Sure. Until I played it and I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. I still think it is weirdly ticky tacky in a lot of ways, but it doesn't feel like something that I could never, ever learn to understand. You know, that's one of the ones I feel that has, has had the most influence on me in the past. I think that expectations change the more games that you play and the longer you go in the hobby the more that you have expectations for things based on your assumption of what a euro game is based on your assumption of what this publisher is you know based on your assumption of what a designer is that some of those genuine moments of discovery are sort of like oh my god are kind of gone or absent because you know, it's like, okay, Queen Games has a new Stefan Feld game coming out. Okay, we know 60% of the rules. I can right. construct the rule book right now. And I say that, and I have a Stefan Feld game as a, as a positive uh, example later in the episode. But the publisher for me is one that I think is really important to pay attention to that many people don't. And I kind of think about a board game publisher, or I have been recently, like a, who curates a museum? A curator? A curator, yeah. One who curates? Yeah. Is that a legal Scrabble placement curator? Yeah, absolutely. In my family, you could add ER to any verb, and that was Uh, definitely (laughs) allowed in Scrabble. Legit. No, before you even said anything, curator was the word I had in my head, so... So it's a word. Yeah. So it counts. 
you know, they're that first layer, right? They're getting hundreds of game submissions probably every month, and they're choosing and collating and collecting. And, you know, we know what Capstone Games stands for right now. And so then when Capstone Games, you know, releases like Stick'em or Stilch'em or whatever, like that small card game, you're a little like, eh, is that... Is that a capstone game? You know, like that doesn't ladder up to everything else that I've seen them make thus far. And the publisher for me is now the first thing I think about. The first thing I look at five years ago, Fantasy Flight was, oh my God, you know, everything that they did, I was excited to check out, you know, in the Battlestar Galactica, Twilight Imperium, Cosmic Encounter. And now I probably won't play a a Fantasy Flight game. So for me, like... I think a lot of the mismatched expectations are internal and just come from experience. And I don't know whether that's good or bad, but that is how I think about expectations when it relates to board gaming. Yeah, I'm with you. I think for me, the biggest source of expectations is publisher. Like Stonemaier, you expect a high production, like slick game. Queen, like you were saying, I feel like Queen, it's going to be a solid game, but production is going to be like right down the middle. Like you're never going to get anything like too flashy or, you know, it's just going to be by the numbers. You know, you've got like CGE and Splatter, which I think are like the quirky publishers. Hollenspiel for me is like even more so. It's even more like company run from somebody's garage feeling but maybe even more off the beaten path in terms of like the type of game and the and mechanics that are involved in their games but yeah for me when it comes to publishers that i almost always am going to be getting or interested in it's going to be capstone and what's your game those are the two publishers for me that are almost always going to go after when they when they're releasing a, a new game there's also the designer kanitsi i think you're always going to expect a solidly built game but not necessarily always like a winner like you know i've played a bunch of kinesias that i think are just completely sound but not interesting enough to be something i want to hold on to but mark yes, can uve rosenberg make a bonanza or must he only make farming games for you i mean he made a bonanza i know it was fantastic yeah I but love, did I love that bonanza. mismatch your expectations did you get all jumbled up inside mm-hmm. that was his first big one was Bonanza. Uve is like a chameleon. He, well, I guess he's like sort of a chameleon that milks... Farming. <laughs> well, farming or, you know, tiling. He, right. he finds his thing and he just like jumps on it and gets it for all it's worth. But, you know, there's also like, you know, Lacerda, you know, it's going to be complex to the point of perhaps being overcomplicated. You, and you've got like Whirly, who I think makes interesting designs. So those are like the biggest sources for me. Mainly publishers and uh, and designers is what I'm looking at. So speaking of expectations and where we seek them or where we're looking for them, when was the last time you guys were surprised, be it pleasantly or otherwise, by the expectations you had for a game? I have now played 1.7 games of Macau uh, online by uh, Stefan Feld and have just been delighted by how harsh it is. You know, going into a Stefan Feld game, I have the expectation, right, that it's going to be some mishmash of mechanisms, which it is, with a bunch of ways to score points, which it is, but that it's more on this sort of side of everything is great and some people are just a little bit greater. You know, like salad is always good for you. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Especially with with the point salad. Why would you... You can't you right gotta, when I was. You gotta hit that joke quickly. That's not a joke that's uh, gonna like ferment well. Or do you understand timing? Yeah, I was helping you out on that very point. This must be lag because usually you're a little better than this. <laughs> <laughs> and with Macau, it's delightfully punishing. The central mechanism is essentially select two dice, but but you know if you select one, you get to use it right now. And you may need to use it right now because you get punished if you don't have any dice. If you select five in five turns, you're going to have a great turn because you get to do five worth of an action. And so that mixture of having to plan out whether to take a benefit now or to plan for the future is really, really agonizing. You know, you're fighting a, a battle on multiple fronts. You're fighting the turn order track and you're trying to get adjacency and you're trying to collect resources and you're trying to get your boat to places first to get the most points. And not to mention, on top of that, there's a very punishing card system where the first time you play it, you're like, ooh, goody, like all these powers that I'm going to unlock. And then, you know, you actually realize, no, if you don't 
fulfill these contracts, you start getting negative points every time you have to get another card. And so suddenly you're like, oh no, I actually just have to take the worst cards possible with one cost, you know, and you get stuck or you get trapped in this, take both of the ones, hope that you can get a card, otherwise you're just going to get negative points. Yeah. And so my perception of Stefan Feld, having played, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of his games perhaps, was not lived up to when I played Macau and have been pleasantly surprised. And I'd be happy to own it, you know, to the point that I was tempted to get in on Queen Games uh, ripoff of a Kickstarter that they have running. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back to something I mentioned in what we played uh, with Prospero Hall, where the expectations for them have sort of swung for me. Uh, you know, you see these IP driven games and you have low expectations and you see them on Target shelves and you don't think they're going to be gamer quote-unquote games and then you start playing them and they're all you know super solid if not great and so it's gotten to a point where the expectation has swung for me from no expectations to now of pan am i think was as i mentioned earlier hurt because of my heightened expectations for prospero hall games i mentioned earlier that i'm a huge fan of uh, capstone and what's your game who i think for me have always really hit after hit uh, at least as far as games I enjoy. But what's your game? I have had a couple of games recently that have been flops for me. Railroad Rivals and Loot Island were two of their recent games. They release a game or two a year. So, you know, sort of along the lines of Days of Wonder where they have this one game that you're expecting and you, you feel like they're going to have a lot, a lot of polish. What's your game is sort of like that. And so I was especially disappointed with Railroad Rivals and Loot Island because they were their releases and fell a little short for me. And Capstone is, I think every single Capstone game I've ever played has been a game I, I really enjoyed. And so uh, Ragusa, which was a game that even looking at the rules, a cursory reading of the rules and looking at how it played and it has like unique mechanisms, everything seemed like it'd be a game that I would enjoy, but it's a game that fell flat for me. And because of Capstone's like enormous success rate for me just having one game for them that like really fell flat was especially even shocking so it was a situation where capstone's super high expectations hurt a game that's solid but felt like especially like a flop to me yeah i think the most recent unpleasant surprise in terms of expectations i had is also in the vein of publishers who have consistently delivered games i've liked in my case it's cge i can't think of one of their big box games that i don't like at least a little bit like i would say the closest a game that they've made to being one that i didn't love was something like tash kalar even then i was surprised on revisiting it with kellen recently that it had more than i had seen on first blush Sanctum, on the other hand, rode a roller coaster of expectation for me because I liked the premise of this so much. And this was now the follow up game from Philippe Neduc, who had created the excellent Adrenaline. So that married with the CGE label and the promise of them delivering a Diablo video game like experience was something I was really into conceptually. I also played that game at Gen Con in demo format. And I came away being very positive on it, but with one question, which they chose not to demo to us, was how does the end game work? And it turns out the answer to that question is that the end game doesn't work because that is the biggest flaw that Sanctum has. And that kind of derails the entire experience in a lot of ways. I also feel like it, it starts to feel a little bit, even after the first or second game of it, you start to see the basic loop. It, it's pleasant enough, but it doesn't live up to, I think the high expectations that I have on a CGE game. They have a lot of games that are just ultimately some of my favorite games through the ages, Tolkien, and I think the expectations perhaps were too high just on the basis of that. Otherwise, on the pleasantly surprised spectrum, Unmatch is a game recently that I, you know, going in thinking that this was going to be just another version of Dice Throne, which was a game that I didn't love so much, especially when you sort of compare it to something like Funkoverse, which I don't have any strong opinions on Funkoverse, but like my expectation when you tell me, oh, we're going to cross mix all of these licenses together and it's going to be a one versus one battler that people are comparing to Dice Throne. I went in with very low expectations and I was pleasantly surprised at how well it sort of works, despite being this weird mishmash of multiple licenses. So I think even if you're not very well acquainted with these publishers or with these designers or all these other different variables where you can sort of source your expectations, one thing that is a clear area where you can have expectations set is the price tag, is the sticker price in the box. So how has price affected 
your expectations compared to what you got once you opened up the box? I, I ask this partially because, you know, I no longer live in a land where I consider money when it comes to buying games. I, I live in a land of barter for cardboard, so I'm, I'm constantly trading for games. And I'm sort of out of the Kickstarter side of things. I'm out of that loop. So I rarely even know what the price is of a game except to value it for trading. So I'm curious to hear how you guys have been surprised or affected by the price tag of games. I think you've escaped like the biggest circle of hell when it comes to this, which is Kickstarter specifically, frankly. like I, I think Kickstarter has ballooned and created unrealistic expectations of the price of games where that always seems to be the area where my expectation of what I'm getting when you add up the cost of what you're buying versus what you get always feels a little bit, you know, off kilter. Because often, like, especially if you're going all in on some of these games, you're often creeping into, like, the past the $100 mark for a single board game. And obviously that comes with a lot of content depending on the project, but you still are paying a lot for a single game ultimately. I think that the times where this has been felt the most keenly to me is when I especially have very high anticipation for a game, for example, in the second Kickstarter run. For Seventh Constant is the example that I keep coming back to in my mind, where this was a game that would, you know had already had its first Kickstarter fulfillment. It was lauded, it was praised. And then the second Kickstarter launches, and I'm like thinking, this seems like a lot of money to pay for this game, but people are raving about it. And then because I've spent that money on it at the time it eventually comes, which is, you know, a year, months later, I suddenly have, like, all the expectations in the world about what this is going to deliver. And frankly, I don't think Seventh Continent is that great. So that, like, gulf, that differential, I don't think it has ever been bigger than it is right now with Kickstarters being what they are. I think Seventh Continent is the number one game in terms of games that I see for trade or for sale on the secondary market. Like everywhere is like Seventh Continent. That's like the number one game. Well, that's good because you can soon get the number one game on the hotness right now, Seventh Citadel, the follow up to Seventh Continent. Oh, really? Continent. I did not even know about this. Wow. I would have gone with the Eighth Continent, <laughs> but. All right. Yeah. Move it on. Move the franchise on. Yeah. That's how you know it's better because it's higher up. Numbers. Yeah. Money and price and expectations. I think Nealon is, is 100% right to use the, the phrase expectations in close conjunction with Kickstarter, because that is what you buy games on Kickstarter based on expectations. Almost every time I've played a game before a Kickstarter on Tabletop Simulator during a Kickstarter, expectations are deflated to some degree. And that's just a function of what Kickstarter is, which is a hype machine. When you start talking about price... I do think that we as a podcast have, you know, enough review copies now that that also starts getting a little bit of fuzzy around the edges for us in terms of really, really evaluating it. I think that I try my best to judge things based on replay value for price and not really the components in the box. I think that when a game gets above around $50, I look at the box and see what I'm getting, you know, and those ones that, that are two-thirds insert, you know, uh, and then like cards in the corner. I'll go back and look at the MSRP and kind of question that quizzically. But for the most part, my expectation for whatever that means is that I will play something like over $50 more than five times. And that something in the 20 to $30 range, I'd be fine playing that twice if it's not a crappy card game, you know? But I think that what I need to stop doing is buying games where I know I'll like it like one time. You know, like that one time is enough to justify because in Corona land, it's just been crazy. You know, I just have games, so many games right now. I don't know. I'm going off topic. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was sort of joking earlier when I was talking about the fact that I only trade for games, although I, I mainly do. But even in trading, you know, I'm assigning values to games. So when I'm trading for a expensive game, I am trading value for it. So there, you know, it's, it's not like I'm without some sort of like payment. And honestly, I don't mind trading high value for a game that feels well designed, for lack of a better term, like for example, like these 18xx games, these splatter games, these Hollenspiel games, they are more expensive than they quote unquote should be. And a lot of times, those are economies of scale situations. You know, splatter are like a mom and pop shop. Hollenspiel even more so. They're making these games in their garages, and so that you know the, the price per unit is up. But when I play a game like an 18xx or something like that, 
I feel like whatever I paid for or whatever I traded for it is in the box. Like I feel like I got my a lot of times got my money's worth. Like I got the value of it. Whereas you know, games like Tapestry, where it's a really slick production and very nice looking pieces that don't really do anything in the game. You know, I feel like that's wasted. It, feel, it feels like such a waste. So honestly, for me, as long as the game is sound and fun, and you know, personally, what I I'm looking for, which is generally like a tough, punishing game. Like if, if I feel like it's constructed well, I don't mind trading a, a high value for that. You know, I, I love seeing good production. For example, this morning I traded for a copy of Too Many Bones, and opening the box up and seeing these like all these chips and dice and like this, you got right into your bathtub with it, right? That's right, the neoprene. <laughs> It'll last forever. You know, it was nice. It's really great to see. But as long as the game is good, I'm willing to pay a premium for a, a game that I enjoy, for a well-designed game. I don't mind if the, the bling isn't there most of the time. But it, it is a nice touch, for sure. Nice pieces and nice plastic molds and all that stuff is, is nice if you can get it. But I'm fine if uh, as long as the game is solid. So I think the other avenue where you potentially pay more for a game without necessarily knowing what you're getting is with out of print stuff. And I wonder if you've ever, if either of you have ever had the experience of tracking down something that you've been anticipating that is hard to acquire and just being let down at the ultimate reveal, whether that's because of price or because of like just the expectation of what you were going to be getting out of the game. Yeah, I've definitely done that for out of print games, but generally I'm okay. Because that's like a time investment more than yeah, anything sometimes. Right. Although for me, you know, I'm, I'm sort of scattershot in games I'm trading for, but, you know, I have sought out out of print games. But, you know, the thing with out of print games is if you don't like them, you can generally trade them for a, at a high price or, or for high trade value. You know, you run into those things. I'm actually in that with Macau right now where I traded for it. I like the game, so it's fine. But, you know, I traded for it at a high value, and now the value is starting to drop a little bit because the new Queen, uh, what you call it, Queen ripoff, Kellen? I called it Macau 2. <laughs> yeah, the Macau 2 Hamburg. <laughs> Macau 2 Hamburg, or whatever it is, which is funny. But, you know, that, so the price of that is starting to dip, so that's sort of a tough thing. But, um, yeah, I think um, with out of print games, if you like it and you're willing to invest, fine, but you can generally flip them pretty quickly, but you always run the risk of it being reprinted. Mark used the naughty word there. Which word is that? Not replayability, but invest. Um, I, I, you did say it. I did say roll it. The, roll, roll the tape. tape. Yep. I think this is pertinent because I'm talking about uh, getting a copy of Stamps, uh, which is one of Oink's first game releases, and it's Japanese modern art in an adorable case. And the going rate is 250-ish? but up to like over 400 on BGG. And, and at that point, you're talking about like a collection item as opposed yeah. to like a functional board game. And so you're yeah. off in La La Land and, and that expectation will never match. You know, it's not worth that amount of money. Totally. Right. And even Square on Sale, you know, a game I uh, talked about last week in our auction game, someone in our Patreon Discord channel asked how much I paid for it because they wanted to get it. And, you know, I translated the um, funny money, or as they call it in Japan, yen, and figured out that I had spent about 70 bucks on it. And that did cause me to sort of reevaluate and say, like, do I still recommend it to people at that price point? Yeah, you know, and I had, sure. I had to give that caveat. And, and, and for me, you know, I like Japanese board games, and therefore I can add $20 to the price. But that's a bias of mine. And you know, my expectation for that Japanese game that I'm literally importing from Japan, I'm not evaluating it as a $70 item. I'm evaluating it more in the 40 to $50 range right. because I'm paying like a luxury tax, mm -hmm. you know, because my tastes have gotten stupid. Right. Yeah. I, I've been thinking about this a lot and just in the context of buying Glory to Rome and not getting the terrible Arthur edition. But then as soon as you start looking into the, into the black box edition, it's obviously the prices on that are just absurd i'm still saying we start up a rival kickstarter company and we just release glory to rome and with new art okay. and we don't call it what do we call it race for rome because it's like yep. glory it's it's basically race for the galaxy what do we call it import rome or export <laughs> glory export <laughs> And we would make a ton of money. We'd be doing a service to the board game community. And the only one who would hate us forever is my best friend, Mr. Carl Chudiak. <laughs> who cares about that? Cash money. 
So that's going to do it for our discussion on expectations. But why don't you go to boardgamebarrage.com slash discord and go to our podcast channel and talk about games where your expectations were met or exceeded or were crushed, especially the latter, because I'm always interested in hearing tales of heartbreak. That's what I'm into. As always, you can find us on all forms of social media. We're on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. You can find uh, our website at boardgamebarrage.com, our Discord at boardgamebarrage.com slash Discord, and our math trade, which you should definitely join because they are super fun at boardgamebarrage.com slash trade. So Board Game Barrage, there's three sort of tributaries coming from that river of power. Thank you, as always, to Heart Society for our intro and outro music, What's On Your Mind, Kid? And until next week, see you guys later. Have fun gaming. <laughs> Bye. Did we clap? I don't know that we did. Oh, we didn't uh, even clap. We didn't clap. Like a bunch no, of it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, three... Two, one. That cadence um, was terrible. Three, two, one. <laughs> How are we supposed to match your clap if you didn't say it like that? All right, I just right. hope that you play the tape unedited this week <laughs> so people can see what an <laughs> you are. Uh, <laughs> Mark. Yes, sir. Your description of Pan Am was so long that I won a beautiful Pokemon card auction on eBay during <laughs> it. Which I'm card? serious. I want to show you right now. Okay. It's um, Shining Mew, Koro Koro from Japan. It's really cute. Whoa. Oh, you know what? One of our listeners, I keep meaning to mention this, but one of our listeners included a Pokemon card that looks a lot like this one. I'm sure it's not this one. What? In a game that he sent me. Okay. And you were going to give that to me when? I assumed I mean, it would be worthless, but hold on. Let me actually let me grab it. Hold on. <laughs> this one was... I'll tell when he comes back. Okay, here, actually, I found it. I honestly thought I might have lost it, but luckily it was, like, right on top of these Perfect. boxes. Anyway, it's actually not a hologram, but it's this guy. It looks ex- identical. <laughs> you were going to give this to me when, right? Yeah, like, today I was going to give it to you. <laughs> what is this guy? This guy looks like he has blue hair. I don't know what <laughs> oh, he is. What? But, Mark, guess how much this Pokemon card is. It is... No, 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 mine, not that. No, I know, no I know, I know, I know. Okay. Twenty dollars. Nope. Twenty cents. Going higher or lower? Well, that's, that's the game. Okay, what do you, you mean? Gotta get, okay, you gotta give me colder or warmer. Hi, you're going okay, higher. Okay, twenty. Higher. Higher. Twenty-five. Higher. Thirty. Higher. Look, I bought. We're gonna be here sports cards before, so I'm okay with this. I'm no problem. Uh, Fifty. Higher. Sixty. Higher. A hundred. Lower. Okay, seventy-five. But only because I sniped him while you kept talking. <laughs> Well, they thank me for that. Uh, what, 95? Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah. <laughs> something like that makes me think it was on the higher end. Yeah, it was like 98 <laughs> or something <laughs> plus shipping. <laughs> what makes, I don't know. I mean, it's a dumb question. Like, what makes that so valuable? But it's probably rarity and... Yeah, it's from pre-2000. Oh, okay. Only printed in Japan. Mm. This one I'm looking at has <laughs> Japanese <laughs> writing on it. So that's good. Presumably, yeah. but the copyright is 2013. Mm. Yeah, that that's going to hurt your uh, value there. Oh, it's number 516. Oh, that's a good number. That's in English. He's got 90 hit points. That's got to be good. Yeah. <laughs> you want at least 90 hit points <laughs> on your Pokemon cards. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. That brings my total army of Pokemon's hit points up to 90. Yeah. Just field <laughs> your deck against Kellen's. <laughs> that's right. I mean, I will say you left it in a very prominent position in your house, you know, like right there where you yeah. could get it at a moment's notice. Look, it's a genuine Pokemon card. You can see the back right there. That is. I'm yeah. not lying to you. Yeah. If you flip it upside down or right side up, it says Pokemon on the back. It's so the you same. know it's legit. Although the ball doesn't work. The ball is upside down clearly here. Yeah. <laughs> this is all making this it on the episode. Play, yeah, sure. this is playing well yeah. on the audio podcast. Yeah. It's not a, a visual palindrome. As <laughs> <might have> <laughs> All right, enough of Pokemon. I'm looking forward and to it. I getting... wasn't feeling good today, Mark. You, know, you were? Know wh- yeah, you want to know why? Because you want a $90 Pokemon? No, I was rummaging through a drawer. Okay. And I you found me? some chapstick okay. that I had never seen before. Okay. Make and I, then I looked at the flavor and I said, ooh, vanilla latte was the chapstick flavor. Okay. And I put some of that on and I had a, a nice time <laughs> by myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> Christina stopped by. She said, ooh, what is that smell? Ooh, goody. Yeah, and then she told me, she told me that I could get kissed more oh. if I wore that vanilla latte chapstick. Nice. So now I got my lucky vanilla latte chapstick <laughs> today. Well, there you go. And then you bought a Pokemon card for ninety dollars. So and and then you have tried better to and better. kill my vibe, dude. Well, Can, hold. Let me go reapply. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm back. I definitely want to. I definitely want to give Planet Unknown a spin, which it can do since it has a lazy Susan. Get yes, it? I see what you did you there, Mark. That? That's, that's comedy. So that is Planet Unknown by Adam's Apple Games. I just found out that this Pokemon is called Simapore. And his base friendship is 70? That's what the hell is base high. friendship? What's base friendship? What kind of stat is that? What? That's a good stat. So they have friendship levels? Simapore? What are you talking about? This is Simapore. Do you not even know who Simapore is? This guy, Simapore. He's I a geyser Pokemon. Know. How'd you look it up? I looked up the number 516. You typed He's got it in gluttony. Japanese? His ability is gluttony. My keyboard's in English. Okay. How do you spell Simapore? Just how it sounds. I'm trying. Everything I'm trying isn't working. <laughs> Just do Pokemon number 516. Yeah. Classic. Classic Simipore. Well, I like this better than recording. <laughs> <laughs> Simipore. He's kind of ugly. What? Oh, he's been in the anime, though, so I should have remembered his appearance. Yeah. The gender ratio is 87.5 male to 12.5% female. What does that even mean? Does that mean in the wild that's where they're at? Yeah, that means the men have got it good. <laughs> No. That's oh, the, the other way? Yeah, the other way. Oh, no. 